As we continue our discussion on metabolism, it's very important to make sure that before we get into the biological perspective of metabolism and what it really entails, we have to look at it from more of a chemical side, a chemistry side, specifically a thermodynamic component that is involved in metabolism plays a huge role in our understanding of what metabolism really is. And you have to understand the thermodynamics behind it before you can move any further. And that's what this video and this flowchart will be dedicated to. So we're actually going to entitle this flowchart energy. And this is going to be the first time we actually explicitly talk about energy. We've mentioned it before in several videos um, throughout the bio lectures so far. But this is the first time we're going to be looking at it from a very sort of in-depth thermodynamic perspective. And I'll explain what thermodynamics are as we continue in this video. So energy, and of course we label this with big E. And energy, we're just going to simply define it very quickly on the top as the capacity to do work. That's a definition you should understand by the end of this flowchart especially, but just have this in your mind as we continue dissecting the idea of energy. So energy comes in two basic forms that you're responsible for in general biology at least, and these forms we can write down over here. The forms include kinetic energy, you might have heard this term before in your physics class, and also another term you might have heard in your physics class, potential energy. So there are two forms of energy, which is two forms of capacity to do work, kinetic or potential. Kinetic is simply defined um, as the energy of motion, and potential energy is simply defined, I will say motion energy, as the energy of store, uh, stored energy, let's say, just stored energy. Because that's what potential is all about, something that's stored within something. So there are two types of poten two types of energy, excuse me, kinetic and potential. Keep those in the back of your head as you also keep this idea of capacity to do work in the back of your head. Now we can talk about the laws of thermodynamics. Some of the most important statements in life are encompassed by these laws. And all of life follow these laws. If we go back to our first lecture, um, maybe even the second lecture on the scientific method, we understood that a law is something that always happens under certain circumstances. We can imagine that the laws of thermodynamics are things that are always going to happen on the circumstance of the planet Earth, let's say. These things are absolutely true and very, very important to understand. So let's look at the first law. And we'll do that one here. There are two laws you are responsible for, and we'll look at the first and the second law a little bit later. The first law states that, and this is a bit of a wordy definition, so I'll just warn you beforehand, we'll get through it and dissect it just like we always do. So the first law is defined as and states energy cannot be created or destroyed. Okay? And it continues. It can only be converted from one form to another. One of the most famous statements in science altogether. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. You can probably say nor destroyed here, grammatically speaking. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only converted from one form to another. What does that even mean? We see this very obviously in nature in some of our most beloved organisms and it's seen in photosynthesis specifically of or by plants. Photosynthesis is the idea of sunlight energy not being created. The plants don't create energy. They do create their own food, let's say. But this process all starts by taking energy from the sun and then converting it into chemical energy, aka something like glucose or sugar. Because we know that plants make their own food. And because they make their own food, they make their own accessible chemical energy. But let's remember, 
You cannot create energy. You can't create energy. That's not that, that will violate the first law, nor can you destroy it. What can you do? You can take something like the sunlight's energy and convert it into chemical energy. This is something you have to sort of memorize, unfortunately, but it's an important law that's very, very important when studying metabolism altogether. So that's our first law. Can't be created nor destroyed, only converted from one form to another. What proof do we have? It's photosynthesis, sunlight energy turning into chemical energy. The second law is a little bit more dense, um, but we'll get through it just like we did for the first law. So the second law of thermodynamics. The second law states that every energy transfer, so it's building on the first law because this states that it can only be converted from one form to another. We can also say that it can only be transferred from one form to another. So every energy conversion, every energy transfer increases what is known as entropy um, of universe, let's say, of universe. So this is a new word, and you have to understand what this means. Every energy transfer, any time we convert energy from one form to another, we are increasing the entropy of the world, of the universe, actually. So let's define entropy. Entropy, which is just abbreviated as the letter S, is defined as the measure of disorder. Very interesting wording of the definition, and another part of the definition you have to know is that entropy is always, always increasing. So that is what entropy is. That's the definition of entropy. In addition to that, we have to also understand a little bit more detail what this means, measure of disorder, and why is it always increasing. We can look at entropy from two perspectives, let's say. From the perspective of food, the en entropy that's located or sort of trapped within food, and the entropy located or trapped within heat. And this is going to get a bit crowded here. I haven't spaced this out quite right, but I'm going to sort of speak through the parts that should go underneath food. So food, we can consider food um, organized energy. Consider food organized energy. And it's organized energy, and you can write this down, because it's found as chemical bonds. Remember biological molecules? Biological molecules were all about those bonds, the glycosidic bonds, the peptide bonds, the ester bonds, um, even phosphodiester bonds of DNA and uh, nucleic acids. All of that is organization, having things built together in a very systematic pattern. And food is well organized in chemical bonds. This actually is something that would then have a low entropy, let's say. Low, excuse me, low S. Because, and remember S stands for entropy, because entropy is a measure of disorder. Is something that's organized also disorderly? Of course not. So we say that food has a low entropy. And because it has a low entropy, we say that it's usable for work. Meaning that we can consume it and then we, through our own metabolic processes, can convert this organized energy into a much more, let's say, disorganized um, uh, end result that we'll talk about, especially when we get into cell respiration. But overall, what you want to definitely focus on is the idea that food is considered organized energy because it's in chemical bonds. It's nicely organized. Thus, its disorder is very low. Its entropy is low. And because its entropy is low, we can actually use it for work eventually by consuming it. Heat, on the other hand, what do you expect? Organized energy or disorganized energy? Of course, heat would be disorganized energy. So that's the difference, disorganized energy. And why is this disorganized energy? Well, food was organized energy because it was found in chemical bonds, okay? It was nicely organized in chemical bonds. Heat, on the other hand, is very disorganized because it's just a bunch of kinetic energy, remember, motion energy. Um, I'll actually put, let, let's say, a star here, since I have some room here. And the star indicates that we're going to move over here and finish what this statement should say, is that it's disorganized energy that comes from the kinetic energy, Ke, of particles. 
So particles move around really, 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 really fast and they possess a lot of motion energy. And because they possess a lot of motion energy, they possess a lot of heat. Because heat and energy in this circumstance, we can say, are synonymous. And because they're moving around so randomly and crazily, they're considered disorganized. They are not organized because they're not in bonds. These particles are moving around so fast and so crazy that they're disorganized in energy. So what would you say about the entropy of these guys? Their entropy is high. They have a high S. They have a high entropy. In addition, these guys actually can't do work. I'll squeeze that in right there because their entropy is way too high. What happens then? Their sort of end-all be-all is that they actually get dispersed into environment. This is why you feel heat. Whenever you feel something radiating heat, that's because there's disorganized energy, all of these particles, jumping out into the environment and dispersing into the environment. This is what causes, let's say, when you take out food from, let's say, the microwave and you see sort of that steam coming off of it, that steam represents disorganized energy, energy with a lot of entropy that can't do work and just disperses into the environment. So those are two types of entropy, one with high entropy and one with low entropy. Food and heat are two sort of opposite ends of a spectrum. And the very last thing we'll talk about in this video is that, um, and I'll try to squeeze it in here, is that energy conversion, I'll say, isn't 100% efficient, EFF. What do I mean by this? Almost every single time we try to utilize this first law, which states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, it can only be converted from one form to another. When we convert, let's say, sunlight energy to chemical energy, or let's say when we convert food into chemical energy for us, like ATP, if you remember, at the end of every sort of cellular respiration equation, you know that classic C6H12O6 plus H2O yields however many ATP molecules, leads some CO2, but at the end of all those fancy equations is always what? Heat. Heat is always at the end of those equations because of this right here. The second law dictates that. Energy conversion. Let's say if you eat glucose, you're going to obviously get ATP. That's clear form of energy, but you're also going to lose some energy as heat. And we can state this as the idea of that some energy, and we can put this into words, disperses as what? As heat, of course. Oops, let me just get that out of the way. Um, as heat. Some energy is going to disperse as heat. Um, that energy is, of course, going to be high in entropy. And then um, the basic example your notes give, which is really kind of cool, is and uh, very easy to understand, is a car engine. Think about a car engine. A car engine, we don't have to be mechanical engineers to know that a car engine is actually, remember, the energy that you feed a car is what? Gasoline. And gasoline, from what we know and what the way that cars work, that gasoline is only 20 to 30% efficient at being turned into mechanical motion energy, let's say, mechanical movement of the car. What does the rest of the car happen? What happens to a car if it's working too hard? It heats up. The rest of the energy is lost as heat. 70% of the energy that's converted is lost and converted into heat. So overall, we now understand what energy is all about. Energy, of course, is the capacity to do work. Whether that work is motion work or stored energy, energy comes in these two forms, known as kinetic and potential, which are both a part of the laws of thermodynamics. They fall under these laws. These laws are all encompassing, seen all throughout science, including biology. That's why we study them. The first law clearly states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only converted or transferred from one form to another. Our example of that was photosynthesis, sunlight turning into chemical energy. Our second law, states that every, every, every energy transfer increases the entropy, which is also denoted by the letter S, of the universe. We prove that through this idea of food and heat also having less and more um, entropy, and then we said that energy conversion isn't always 100% efficient. Now we have a good grasp of what energy is about, and we can finally apply this idea of metabolism and energy and thermodynamics to biology by looking at chemical reactions that we see every single day, every single moment of our lives in the next video.